have a talk on depression script. I don't think that's ever been covered in this club. You know, it's a fascinating area, and it's our own Vic and, and uh, well, carry on. Okay. okay, so depression era script is a admittedly a very obscure area of collection. Uh, it is a very historically significant one, and it's also one that's kind of grown very dear to my heart as of the past couple of years. The one I put on the cover was the very first piece of Depression script that I ever bought. I think it was about two years ago. So, well, to talk about Depression era script, we start at the beginning. Relatively speaking, 1933 was the beginning. What happened in 1933? Oh, well, we all know that one. That was the 1933 Double Eagle. Oh, we went off the gold standard, went off on the silver standard. You know, uh, you probably don't know the orders by number, but like Executive Order 6102, that was when it was illegal to start boarding gold. The Gold Reserve Act was the one that took us officially off the gold standard, and now we're on the silver standard. Okay, well, okay, that's, that's nice and all. It just ignores a very large piece of what was happening in the country at that time, and also a little bit before and after as well. See, these kind of things happened at the same time. This is from Michigan. This one is the one made out of Dow Metal from uh, Dow Chemical. We've got some very unusual ones here. This is an oyster-shaped piece of strip, a 25-cent piece, which is I think about the size of a quarter or thereabouts. They had other ones similar to this, like a fish. We also have these here, like very large wooden dollars. You cannot tell on a slide because of the scale, but you can tell because I have it here. These are massive. These particular ones are about twice the size of a silver dollar, to give you an idea. And yes, it was a real dollar, apparently. Like, it was meant to be spent, but not all that long. Okay, so historically, this is a propaganda note that was issued in 1936. For obvious reasons, some people were kind of mad at the government at the time. Um, so, I mean, you know, in the 1920s, we had the boom cycle, and then, of course, we had one of the most famous events in our history, the stock market crash in 1929. Banks started failing, 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 and, of course, it was 1933, where it got to be particularly bad. It was something to the effect of as many banks were failing in a month in 1933 as did all year in 1931, something to that effect. So, of course, President Roosevelt had his banking holiday where he shut down the banks for a while. This is where he had his famous fireside chats where he was going over the radio and being like, oh, try not to worry, your money's going to be safe, we just got to get this straightened out and all. So, the thing is, all the banks were shut down, so what do people do for money? You can't have a credit card, the first credit card were decades ahead, checks were related to the banks, and so on. What a whole lot of people did said, they said was, uh, well, we're just going to issue our own money for not that long, but for a while. The very first Depression era script did come before 1933. It is dated December of 1931. A lot of them do have months on them, as in also years. They went as far as 1939, at least as far as the main catalog is concerned. Most of them, of course, the vast majority were in 1933, which was the worst point of it. This was obviously stuff that was not meant to be used for a long time. It was meant to be used a lot of times only for a couple of weeks. In some cases, the shutdown period was so short that by the time they had made it for use, they didn't even actually get to issue it. The down metal piece a couple of slides ago was one such thing. Made it, bank already opened, oh, then they actually gave those out as souvenirs instead of circulating them. Um, because of their nature of being used for only a couple of weeks, a lot of them have expiration dates on them. And these were really quite short. In some cases, it would be like issued and then the expiration date was just two months later or maybe six weeks later. They were really meant only for short periods of time. 
As far as I can think, I think the only other money that I can think of offhand that has an expiration date on it were municipal commemorative tokens, the kind where they were like, oh, our city is in our 150th year anniversary, redeemable until, um, whatever, February 1944, that kind of thing. So a whole bunch of people across the country issued it, obviously. I mean, this affected the whole country. Uh, a whole lot of entities issued it, including counties, cities. If the businessmen were the major financial people in a little city, they were the ones who issued and backed it. Sometimes organizations did. For example, I know that the Lions Club of Riverton, Wyoming issued one, for example. Uh, in this case here, the Black Eagle Commandery on this one, I think that's a fraternal organization. So a lot of different types of entities issued it. There are entries for uh, under all 50 states for these, so all of them including territories at the time, including Alaska, uh, including Hawaii, and also including Canada and Mexico. Those ones are a little bit harder to study because, you know, script from other countries is kind of hard to get a hold of, but, but they are fairly well known. There is one major site for this kind of stuff, depressionscript.com. They say, he says on there that there are 3,774 of them in catalog today. I'm not sure how much I believe that because when I looked at his list, copy pasted, I found more like 3,500, so that he missed some. But at any rate, I know he's certainly missing a couple. This one, for example, after I won this one through Heritage uh, two years ago, I can tell, by the way, that this is Depression Script. Might be hard to see, but see over here? It says, not redeemable after January 1st, 1934. So the expiration date and the year is like a dead giveaway. Oh, Depression Script, even if I don't see it anywhere. So in this particular case, I had sent it to him, he responded, he said, oh, I'd never seen it before, but he hasn't updated his site. So this one's not on there. One from Oklahoma that I need to show you in a little while is not on there. New ones are discovered all the time. What's that worth, if we can ask? Well, that one there, well, uh, I bought it for $312. Oh, okay. I, Why didn't you get it free? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I saw a record of one of those about 15 years ago. I don't know if it's the same one, but these are quite rare to begin with. That sold for 450 or 500. So, relatively speaking, I think it was a good deal. Okay, so as far as the script, what counts as them? The vast majority of script is paper in nature, they're supposed to be currencies. The book actually prefaces this by saying that it's kind of intentional. It's supposed to kind of highlight how uh, ephemeral this stuff was. It was supposed to be used and then be done with. It's paper, it's not durable, that kind of thing. Nonetheless, there are a number of things that are also in there with it. Uh, for example, the, uh, there are a lot of trade tokens, like these kind here. Uh, some bimetallic tokens, uh, the, the book, I'm not sure how they figured out on which ones they, uh, they decided to include in the catalog, but they said things like uh, it was when these were really hard pressed into circulation we included them in there. So I guess they had ways of knowing that, oh, these were really circulating where they were supposed to at the time. The Bingles. The ones that you would know from the Red Book as being very hard to get these days, and yet a bunch of them went on eBay last year. Those are actually considered Depression Era script. They were from 1935. They are also, incidentally, the only ones, the only entries under Alaska, so maybe that kind of helped in them deciding, oh, we're going to count this. And there were a whole bunch of other things in there, like unemployment books, not necessarily things that you would spend, but kind of related to it, coupon books. These are unemployment stamps listed in the supplement, and in one case, tax tokens are listed as Depression Era script. Tax tokens were issued during this time. They were for amounts less than one cent. Most of them are not considered script, but I think these ones, the ones from Tenino, Washington, 
were similar enough to the script that was coming from there, which you'll see later on, that they, they thought it was reasonable to consider them to be depression script. Okay, so cancellation marks. This is really important for script, because again, a lot of them were used, they were obviously not meant to be collected, particularly, so they were used, they were redeemed, and they were canceled. For the most part, what these are is the ones that have cancellations on them are generally considered to be worth a little bit less than the uncanceled versions. There are a couple of exceptions, you'll see one in two slides, but the types of cancellations were, or the mo most common ones were, you know, when you put a hole punch through the signatures, uh, in a few of them they sliced the corners off, a lot of them they would put ink stamps saying, you know, canceled on this date in this year, 33 or 34 usually. And some of them had perforations on them, you know, the ones where instead of with the ink stamp, they would cut the little holes and said, you know, pay August 5th, 1934 or whatever. And speaking of which, so a lot of the entries in the catalog will say, you know, issued, not canceled, issued, canceled, but then you got a couple of other kind of sporadic ones in there. So for example, you've got your remainder notes, the way you do with a lot of currency. You've got samples, specimens, proofs, reprints, copies, and in a couple cases, contemporary counterfeits. There was something like, there were very, very few instances of this, but there were a couple of cases where they were known to have been counterfeited. And of the counterfeits, all of them, were contemporary. None to date are known to have been done intentionally in modern times to fool collectors. I mean, this is kind of an obscure topic to begin with. So here are some of the cancellations. Like, this is a very common one from Charleston, South Carolina. This one got its corner cut off. This one actually comes in two varieties, in the sense that this one can have its corner cut off or it can have hole punches in it. You've got the, you see the canceled, the paid uh, for the perforation here. See that there? We had them on our money well before 1946. Uh, that vignette of President Roosevelt actually was present on quite a few script issued from quite a few uh, cities across the country. Here you see, you know, just a nice ink stamp cancellation, a uh, whole bunch, and in this case here, this one is a specimen, though, just to give you an idea. One thing you might want to note is don't do what, oh, let's say one seller on eBay does. Uh, these are kind of different from most money. In other words, if you see this here, oh, specimen note, your first instinct might be, oh, it must be rare. In this case, this particular one is actually not rare. Book-wise, it is actually priced as being cheaper than ones that were actually issued and are not canceled. So do not think of these the way you think of a lot of other money. Just because it's a specimen, it may or may not actually be a lot more valuable than a regularly issued one. Okay, so here there's at least one instance where that cancellation is really quite important. So this one here is from the village of Lowville, New York, a small village where they issued 5,000 of these. And these are considered to be rare. Like, literally, they're considered rare in the book because, according to records, these were all redeemed and canceled. But then the book says, oh, at least two of them are known to be uncanceled. Well, that book is kind of old. I can tell you just from looking at it that there are at least four out there rather than two, this being one of them. So to just give you an idea, so in this case here, being not canceled this means it's worth dramatically more than being a canceled piece. So finally, here's the book. Here's what it looks like. The book, the one that superseded all the ones that come before it, was made, uh, published in 1984 by Ralph Mitchell and Neil Schaefer. So the book is a little bit old, but it is the go-to book. Uh, is, is a nice, very nice starting point as far as the, this field goes. There was also a supplement published for this in 1985 where they found a few more updated couple prices like that. The supplement is very, very thin and much harder to get a hold of than the book. Book is not that hard to get a hold of. There are always a few out there. 
Uh, and again, you also have depressionscript.com, as I mentioned before. The man doesn't update the site too often. He has he said to me that uh, he wants to do that more after he retires. And of course, you know, from there, he's made a list of some of the references that you got there, because you've got a lot of very state-specific, city-specific kind of places. You've got uh, some notes about some of the older literature, like there was a book in 1961 published, that kind of thing. But this is the book, you know, where you, that's your starting point as far as this goes. So, prices. The catalog was from 1984, so I think it's really kind of important to talk about the prices on these things, because this is now 35 years old. What I have found is, generally speaking, supply is low, but demand is lower still. There are not a lot of people collecting this. And from what I have found, generally speaking, across the board, the, the, a lot of these here can be had at or below the prices in the 1984 book. Keep in mind that if you did nothing but adjust them for inf inflation, the prices would be nearly triple what they are printed at. And yet, I have had so, quite a few of these, even ones up here, where I've managed to get them for about half of what is printed in the 1984 book. Give you an idea of uh, the supply and demand that goes on for this. This is obviously not true across the board. Uh, for example, here are a couple of them. This one here is a very interesting one. This ended this past Sunday for $255, and no, I was not the one who won that. I did not even bid on it when it got anywhere near that high. I think this one got a lot of attention because this is completely uncatalogued, undocumented anywhere. Like, this is a very small Kema, Oklahoma, very small town even today. Uh, nothing is recorded from being from that town in particular. And this one here actually says on it, this is a series C meant to replace series A and B. Well, that's kind of giving us a hint there are even more of these out there, but this is brand new. So this one ended up selling for quite a bit. This one here too, this was kind of a heartbreaker for me personally because I was the only one pre-bidding on it and no, I did, was not the one who won this for $1,000 last month. Uh, this one here, the person who runs impressionscript.com won that. I can kind of tell because he told me he would be willing to pay a thousand for it. Uh, the catalog value on this one in the book is a hundred. So that's quite a bit more to give you an idea. But again, these are very rare examples of ones that are selling for a lot more than catalog price or what you would otherwise think. And also, another great, great, great thing about this is, is just how volatile the prices are. The prices will go up and down very much so. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that that I'm very intimately familiar with now. So here, first, eBay versus Heritage Auctions. So here's a Myrtlewood dollar. Uh, I had to doctor this a little bit because I don't have the worth point account, but I was watching this. In last September, this ended up selling for $107. Two years ago, one of these sold for $75. Okay, so that was September of last year. So here's November of last year through Heritage Auctions. So here's the first issue dollar coin, which is this one here. And the second issue dollar coin, and the first issue, and the second issue, 50 cent piece. So four of them together for $94. We're talking about like a three to one <laughs> price difference in a span of two months, give you an idea. And of course, that's not to pick on eBay or anything, here it is in the reverse manner. Here is a pair of them that sold for $104 in September of 17. This one here is literally the same piece, you can tell by the serial number if nothing else, sold in February, I won this one for $34. This one here, I would estimate of that 104, this was probably about $75 of that, I would estimate to give you an idea. And of course, if I wasn't the one winning it, it would have settled for even less. Same with this one here, the very large silver dollar coin. I would estimate that this one was probably about 175 of that $192. 
It's actually quite rare according to the catalog. It's settled on about 104, which is what I want it for. And again, if I hadn't been bidding on it, it would be more like 60. Give you an idea. Again, you have a two to one, three to one type price difference. So give you an idea of price volatility. So it's kind of like, this is something where what you want to do is you want to kind of treat it with a business perspective of you want to make a deal and try not to, if one comes along later and it's less than half what you paid it for, try not to let it get to you. Because it's more like you want to think to yourself, if I don't get it now, I'll never get it again. So you, you try and work out a deal with you. Errors and varieties. Well, pretty much all numismatic fields have errors and varieties, right? What's this one here? This one here's got a planchet flaw in the wooden quarter. What's this one here? This one here, we kind of learned about that last month. It may not be as impressive as an eight-digit number, but it's still a ladder. Serial number three, four, five, six. So they, you've got your errors and varieties that you can collect and you can enjoy. But what I have found is that there are way too few collectors here for the errors and varieties to be a microcosm of the field itself. These would generally sell as if they were regular pieces. In this case here, both of these sold for quite a bit less than the 1984 catalog price. Of course, you do have some exceptions. For example, this is a uh, double denomination. This was normally a uh, something that would be unifaced. Instead, I guess it got accidentally fed through the press twice, and uh, became so you've got 25 cent on one side, 50 cent on the other side, and this ended up selling for 900 dollars, which is quite a bit more than a regular one of these. Believe me. So you could get attention like that. Okay, so that's an overview of the field itself. And now what I want to show you is some of the mo most important archetypes of the most uh, interesting, noteworthy specimens that you can see out there. Non-hoarding checks, as if people were hoarding this stuff to begin with, right? But the idea behind these was when you got it, you were supposed to take it and you were supposed to sign it and spend it. The idea was to illustrate, you know, from economics, the velocity of money. It's one dollar can do seventy dollars worth of purchases type deal. That was the idea behind them. And these here, the non-hoarding checks, most of them have really low mintages. For example, there was one that was issued, we don't know where it is anymore, a four feet by eighteen inch check that was spent fifty-four times in twelve days from Akron, Ohio, and there was only one of them. And again, it's disappeared. We don't know where that one is. Uh, for example, here's another one, you know, Pajaro Valley National Bank. This one's from California. You know what happiness, courage, optimism, and prosperity are? Those, well, this one here, picture is courage, because those are the serial numbers of this thing. Because there were only four of them issued, they gave them names rather than serial numbers. Again, you know, low mintages. And of course, there were a number of other places. Some of them were more common. But many of them, there was another one where they issued four, another one where they issued three, and obviously we're not supposed to keep them, so I do not personally know how one might collect this if one wanted to. Tax anticipation notes, these were really common. The idea was if a city had a bunch of debt to it, they used that debt as their backing to issue the notes. Uh, this one here is a very nice, colorful one from Michigan. I actually bought one of these at our show in January from the guy who has a depression script. Uh, in this case here, not only was it issued, not only was it backed by delinquent taxes, it says as much, it actually was an interest-bearing note. Some of these are interest-bearing notes. This one was 3%. You might recognize that from Civil War era money, and I think that's the only place I can think of elsewhere where this kind of thing happened. Uh, other examples would include one from Knoxville, Tennessee, and this is where the one of them that was issued was the contemporary counterfeit. Stamp script. This is a very interesting one. I'm pretty sure this is the only time Americans did this. 
Uh, Germans, Austrians used that kind of thing where they had money that would depreciate every week to, to, uh, to dissuade people from hoarding it. So uh, that idea kind of came here by one Charles Zilstra. The idea was you were to, if you got this currency on it, uh, you were to buy these here. They're sometimes available in unused form on top of that, at least in this case here. You were to buy a two cent stamp, so whenever you would use it, sign it, cancel that little two cent stamp, and then pass it on. And of course over here, in this particular case here for the two cent stamps, there is room for a dollar four worth of stamps. Why? Well, you got a dollar for the dollar, and then like four cents to make up for the cost of printing it, that kind of thing. So this was one of the kinds of things that would pay for itself. You can kind of guess that these were cumbersome and miserable to use, and they were only so-so as far as the success goes. But there were, like they, they said, there were about a hundred that used it. Again, the one from uh, Oklahoma a little while ago was uh, one such thing, the newly discovered one. Tonino's Wooden Money. This is one of the most famous ones, in part because this, I think, was the very first one in December of 1931. The first ones they issued were made out of cardboard, but then they had this bright idea as a stunt, let's make them out of wood, and then advertise them under the, oh, don't collect any wooden nickels adage, and they issued them like that, and they immediately got attention, and they just kept issuing them, and issuing them, and issuing them, and issuing them, and of course it became a profit-making thing. This is one of the very few, if not only, where they were issued as novelty money, even much more so than really meant to be spent. Uh, they, they said that of the $11,000, which is quite a bit, that was issued, only like $40 was ever redeemed. You can technically still redeem them, not that you'd want to redeem a 50 cent bill that you would pay $30 for, but you can if you want to. Okay, here, play the video. This one here, what this is, <coughs> keep making them, making them, making them. That's their, I mean, that's their one claim of fame, so. Uh, also here are just a couple of the wooden uh, sales tax tokens again. Again, you can see their similarity to the wooden scrip, which is probably why they consider them depression scrip. Uh, the Thurston County Independent was the newspaper that this was originally located at and printed, where they printed these. Now for comparison purposes, this is a nice little video, so I'm going to let the video run. If you stop for a drink in North Bend, Oregon, you can pay with cash, credit, or one of these, wooden coins made from local myrtle trees. Many, many people in North Bend have no idea that we operated at one time on Myrtlewood money. It all dates back to 1933. The Great Depression hit North Bend and the only bank in the city closed. The city had to scramble. It had to pay its employees. Towns all over the country face the same problem. The solution? Ditch the bank and make your own money. So most of them turned to something easy. They just printed pieces of paper and used that as their depression script. But some places were innovative. For the city of North Bend, that meant using an iconic local resource, Myrtlewood. Myrtle trees are known for their wood's vibrant colors and rich grain. Woodworkers on the coast have been using it for decades. In 1933, a local factory cut the wood into coin-sized discs. A local newspaper printed the denominations, and the coins went into circulation. Residents used the coins to pay bills and buy goods, and collectors took notice. That's the beauty of Myrtle Wood, is that no two coins are alike. Collectors think of them as being highly unique. By 1934, the bank reopened, and the coins 
fell out of circulation. Today, collectors still trade them, and the city still backs them as currency. Someone could have come in and bought a Slurpee at 7-Eleven with a Riddlewood coin, and in North Bend, technically, that would work. These curious coins are a reminder, sometimes money does grow on trees. So I included these in no small part just to compare them to the previous novelty wooden money. These ones here were from Oregon, uh, eastern side, and another reason I included them is because you will see pictures like this, the pictures never do these ones justice. These were shellac, they're very shiny, myrtle wood is a very rich grain and they are absolutely gorgeous when you see them, like you can see a couple here. For comparison to the Tenaino money, they only issued $2,000 worth in two waves. And of that $2,000, only $448 is outstanding. And for comparison purposes, that includes two different $10 coins, and two different $5 coins, a $2.50 coin, $2 coins, two fifty cent pieces, a $0.25 cent piece. $10 coins, as you can imagine, are very rare to give you an idea of money that was really not just issued, but really meant to be spent as money and was done so. Sheepskin, buckskin, saddle leather. I mention these because of this little blurb in the book. Prosperity checks, which we saw, wooden money of Tenaino, which we saw in Blaine, which is similar. The sheepskin strip of Hefner, saddle leather strip of Albany, and buckskin strip of Enterprise, all of them in Oregon, probably received more publicity than any other strip of the period. So these were among the most famous, and I think they're the most interesting, personally. So you had Hefner, Oregon, which issued sheepskin strip. They mentioned that part of it was the idea of the uh, sheep flocks at the time, the farmers were losing out on them and it was to kind of create the hand for them. They were issued to teachers originally, but I guess to other people as well. They were issued in regular paper on top of the sheepskin. Those aren't nearly as interesting, but you know, they're there. Then you've got Enterprise Oregon, which is in the northeast corner. They issued buckskin, and this is probably the only time where you can literally say I have one buck. Like I have one here, you can see, as well as a half buck. Uh, the idea behind them was there were a lot of deer native to the area, so it was a very uh, convenient thing for them. And I guess it also deterred counterfeiting if there were, that was ever going to be a problem. And then you have another very interesting one. Ace Sternberg was a, uh, a saddle maker in Albany, which is eastern, uh, no, western Oregon. And because he was like one of the businessmen, one of the main uh, men kind of like propping up the town, and he had a lot of saddle leather to him, he was like, oh, well, this is convenient. He issued it, and uh, it circulated. Here, what this is, is the, uh, the people in Enterprise, they actually issue cardboard money in commemoration of their buckskin strip. You can actually buy it now. There are not that many people buying it, but it's available. And on the next page, we have examples of each of them. The sheepskin, which is reasonably common. The buckskin, this one here is the half buck. You can see the one buck on the table. And the saddle leather, which are really quite distinctive. And I kind of had wished I'd known how rare they were when I saw them two years ago in Heritage. I, I, uh, I, I uh, forewent those for a couple of the other much more expensive ones. They're really nice, and they don't come up a lot. The ones that did come up were same serial numbers that had been sold through Heritage several years prior. Well, that there are not a lot of sets out there of them to begin with, give you an idea. Ismo Beach clamshells. You saw one of those earlier. This is something I would really like, but again, not at $1,000. These were originally said to have been made as a joke. But then when somebody actually bought the $1 clam shell, they started making more at one pharmacy. Then they started making more and more and more. Eventually, 11 merchants issued such things. Uh, they issued them, by the way, Pismo Beach, in case you don't know. That's a reference to Pismo clams. So the very town itself is a reference to, you know, they had a lot of them there to begin with. 
a little bit less famous, but every bit as interesting, is Crescent City, which is much farther north. They did the same thing, and there are actually some unlisted ones in there. Uh, this is Pismo Beach. You can see how they work. They just wrote on them. They signed them on the reverse. They said that somehow one of them went through the post office and has a cancellation mark on it. I do not know how that happens. But, but that, that's, you know, I have no reason to doubt that. The Crescent City ones were a little bit different. Oh, and on the reverse of these, by the way, you actually signed your name. Again, I'm not sure how you could do that with a show, but they, they were able to do it. Uh, on the Crescent City, on the other hand, what they did was they just glued, you know, a piece of paper on there that had all the information issue or how much it's worth, that kind of thing. This one, for example, is unlisted and actually probably unique because of that, because how many of these do you think are outstanding? Well, these are really difficult to get a hold of, but they're really quite interesting. Oh, that one there, by the way, the Chase Manhattan Bank uh, acquired a collection of these at one point, like when they were actually being used. They ended up sending their collection to the Smithsonian. This picture here is of one of the ones in the Smithsonian. They're quite rare, and that's like your best bet to find or just see. And finally, uh, last and best, in my opinion, the rubber dollar. Some of the greatest ones, I think, came from Oregon, Washington. So in a place called Hood River, which is northern Oregon, a man named Hal Nesbitt owned a tire shop, and he issued ones made out of tire rubber. I have been told that these were always not common and always kind of difficult to find. I can tell in part because this is the entry in the, in the, the Depression script catalog. No picture, no uh, comment as far as price goes. In fact, if you take a look at it here, he only transcribed the reverse of it to begin with. I took a look around, I actually, you know, thanks to the modern internet, there was apparently this magazine, October of 33, they actually mentioned it in there, so it was known for its time, it circulated. Uh, these, of course, again, these are really quite rare, but one of them sold through Heritage two years ago, and I don't think it was the first one since at least the creation of the internet that sold, at least one in quite a few decades. So, here you have the picture of that one that sold it. If you take a look for this, this is the picture, the only picture of this that is publicly available and that you will ever see. Well, at least up till now. Uh, and if, by the way, that picture looks only so-so, looks underwhelming, my backup plan, of course, was to bring it here so that you can just see it yourself. You can also tell now maybe why the picture is only so-so. It's <laughs> got to be held under some very thick, heavy plastic because it kind of degraded around the edges, unfortunately. That's why you can kind of you can kind of see the reflection in there, but that picture is much better than the ones that I took of this. You can barely see the text or anything on this and the pictures that I take. I'm just not good at taking pictures. And that's the end of my presentation. So if anybody has any questions, comments, if anybody ever wants advice on this stuff, I'll share whatever knowledge I can. If anybody has any leads, knows of any places that I don't, might not, who have more, I'd be more than happy to look for more. Yeah. Um, were most of, uh, the, was most of this money backed or not? Mo yes, they went out of their way to do that for the most part. Like the counties would do it with the delinquent taxes, the businessmen would back them with their own personal funds, and it would be like, Oh, the people in the town trusted them because they were like a good, successful businessman, and that's why they would circulate. So yeah, they were all actually backed in some manner or another. There was one where um, there was one where a town hired a bunch of uh, people to cut down trees and do lumber and paid them in scrip, and the scrip was circulated. And that one I was told was like not successful and lost the town money. But yeah, the answer is that every one of these issued was backed by something. It was always something different. Anything else? Yes. A couple questions. Um, you used some interesting, or you, you revealed some interesting um, terms that you know you hear in, in common language today, clams, bucks, bounced, yeah. rubber money. 
you know, do you know if any of these terms evolved from the Prussian era script? I'm pretty sure the answer to every one of them is no. Like, Bucks was kind of old. I think that was during the frontier days. Clams, I think, was old, too. I think because the clams was kind of a joke originally. It was like, hey, you want a clam? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in all cases it was kind of a cart before the horse type deal where they, they actually, this, the, those came first for, I'm not sure what reason. My guess would be clams might be from, you know, wampum, the shells. And uh, then they did it afterwards, kind of playing on that. I like think that's so. Uh, yeah. Other question is about the anti-hoarding checks. I get the I get the the um, expiring value or the decreasing value over time of some of some of the later pieces that you showed. But what would be the incentive if I were to, to be given an anti-hoarding check? Why am I motivated to move that forward and help with velocity? You're not, except for, except that you're supposed to. So it's an it, honor, it, honor. It, it was, it was a, well, they, they would send out, they would, they would say like, look, we want you to circulate this money. You're, you're supposed to do it. There, there was no other reason, because the depreciating strip, that was a Germany only thing, other than you having to pay for the little stamps. It's not, it's not like they did in Germany and Austria where the script would slowly depreciate in value over time. It would keep its value, you just had to pay to use it. But yeah, th that was, there was no motivation other than you're supposed to do it. And, and people did it. People did it more, more quickly than they expected them to. Also, it's heavy carrying around full foot. <laughs> yeah, that one, they probably spend it so much because they wanted to get rid of it. Excellent talk. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, I forgot to say that. One of the uh, sheepskin script is one of the door prizes, by the way. Just so you know. Don't forget to pick up your items in the show and tell.